Brought to you from the state of Connecticut, capital city of Hartford, this is a Department of Developmental Services video production. Today's presentation, Community of Practice welcomes Sharon Lewis, Principal Deputy Administrator at the Administration for Community Living, United States Department of Health and Human Services. First of all, I wanted to say thank you um, to Terry and Molly and Kathy and Robin um, for your leadership, for bringing this to Connecticut, for making this happen here. And um, I'm, I'm so excited to see all of you here in this room. Um, from the little bit that I know uh, about everything that you're doing, um, it's incredible. And um, I'm, I'm excited um, to see where you're going and the things that you're talking about. And today I'd like to add a little bit of national context um, to these conversations. Um, as Molly mentioned, and, and for those of you who don't know, um, I, I have lots of government titles and that's all well and good, but the thing that's most important to me is that um, I'm a parent to three uh, incredible, uh, now I get to say young women, my, my youngest turned 16 last week. Um, and is about to get her driver's license. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and importantly, uh, my middle daughter, Zoe, is 17, uh, almost 18, and has uh, an intellectual disability and a whole host of other laundry list things. She's not one of those people who fits nicely into the label box, which actually has served our purposes very, very well. But what if you asked Zoe to describe herself, she had a job interview last week and, and we practiced and I said, so Zoe, when they ask you what your strengths are, what are you gonna say? And she said, I am enthusiastic, I am energetic, and I like to make people feel welcome. And so she's got a pretty good set of strengths and a pretty good sense of self. Um, and that's been true for a long, long time. Um, my, my first uh, interaction in a formal way as a parent advocate um, was when she was very, very small. She was three years old and uh, we were invited to testify at a special joint session of the governor and our state legislature in Oregon um, on uh, Part C and early intervention services because Oregon at the time was one of the, was a state that was um, looking at uh, significant budget difficulties and they were actually considering, elim <laughs> considering eliminating Part C services, because we all know that Part C is optional. And so I was asked to uh, come and talk about um, Part C, and I said, well, that's great, but I didn't experience the services. I mean, I did a little bit in my, through IFSP, but at the end of the day, my daughter did, and, and, and we need to have her talking about why this is important. So we went and we did our little shtick, and she sat on my lap, and we testified before the governor and, and the state legislature. And it, and it did it went pretty well. She, we, we kind of did a Q and A thing where I asked her a couple of questions. I mean, she was three um, about about school and what she liked to do with her friends at school and um, things like that. And then we finished up, and you know, there were gazillions of families and advocates, and it was all lovely. And we were leaving, and and in Oregon, and I, I haven't been in the Connecticut state capital, so I don't know if it's the same here, but many in many state capitals that I've been in, you know, you have that big beautiful rotunda, right? Mm -hmm. In, in the middle. And um, in Oregon, the, there's the big gold seal in the center of the rotunda, which, you know, kind of the unspoken rule is, is you don't walk on it, right? Like you walk around the edges of it and you look at it and da da da. So I'm walking through the rotunda with my daughter, and um, she was probably about six months into walking, so she had that like little, you know, toddler thing going. And she lets go of my hand and she starts going as fast as she can go straight across the seal, no, no hesitation whatsoever, boom, right through the middle, and I look up and I see, where is she going? It's the governor. <laughs> <laughs> so she tears across and, she, and, and his uh, staff, to their credit, kind of looked like, oh, okay, what are we doing now? Um, and stopped, and uh, so he bends down, and, and uh, she, she goes up and she says, governor, governor, kids hover. Dance with me! <laughs> so the music is playing in the rotunda, and he stops, and he does. And it was really awesome. And after that, 
Well, the people in the state capitol had no idea what my name was, but I could walk into a room and they, oh, there's Zoe's mom. <laughs> right? So what she said to me at a very, very young age was that she knew how to live in the moment. She knew that relationships mattered. And she knew how to advocate for what she wanted. And we have spent the last 15 years fostering that. <coughs> and she instinctively did that what we're all having to rethink about in our service systems is to focus on life, not just a service life, but a good life. So there's a lot going on at the national level that's affecting systems change, right? I mean, we're all living it in lots of different ways. The Affordable Care Act certainly is changing the landscape, and for our partners that are working at the state, they would probably say, um, you know, it's doing incredible things on one hand, and it's really straining capacities on, on the other hand, right? We're, we're all having to do a lot with less. We're trying to make sure that every American across this country has access to affordable and effective health care you know, as a, as a basic right. And that ultimately has an impact and effect on our formal delivery systems and what we pay for in Medicaid, and that's going to change the landscape. The Affordable Care Act not only focused on that basic access to health coverage, but it also has some pretty substantial um, changes and opportunities for states in terms of long-term services and supports. Right, so everything from investments in money follows the person to the community first choice and real incentives for states to continue to move their systems away from institutional care and into the community. But then to build upon that, we at HHS also earlier this year published a pretty important rule some of you may be in conversations about that role here in this state, that for the first time in our 30, almost 35 year history of having home and community-based services that are covered by Medicaid, talks about what home and community-based <laughs> services are instead of just what they are not, right? Our conversation for a long time has been framed around it is not an institution, it is not a nursing home, it is not an institution for people with mental illness, it's not an ICF, right? But we haven't said what is it? And finally we have a rule that says this is what it is. It has to be person-centered, if people are living in provider-controlled settings, they have to have choices, they have rights, they can lock their bedroom doors. They can get food when they want it. This is a really important change because it's a change about values. It's about change about person-centeredness, and it's a change about supporting individuals. Now, we know that our service delivery systems are going to take some time to get there, and so the expectation is that states are looking at this and figuring out where are we doing this, where are we not doing this, and engaging with the public to have that conversation and coming forward to CMS and us at HHS to say, this is where it's working, this is where it's not, this is a place we've got to kind of figure it out. And that's a fundamental, fundamental and foundational and long-term change in our systems of formal services and supports. We're also under, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, having important conversations about quality, right? We have a, we in the DD systems have talked about quality for years, right? We do a lot on quality. We talk about quality assurance, we have quality improvement processes, we talk about quality, blah, 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 blah. The end of the day, are we asking families and people with disabilities who are receiving services what they think quality is? And are we defining that with metrics that actually help us move our systems forward and are comparable across states. And we haven't. We haven't done that across the country. Individual states have done that in bits and pieces. 
But under the Affordable Care Act, we have this thing called the National Quality Strategy, and we're actually having conversations about, first and foremost, in our health system, what is quality, and what does it mean to deliver quality in the health system? So, you know, which protocol for diabetes care is actually going to help people with diabetes? What tests do people need to actually get the health services that they need? And what is unnecessary? And we're having those conversations on, primarily on the clinical side because we have years and years of research and investments that show us what is evidence based on the clinical side and we know what to do in our hospitals to move that quality conversation forward. We haven't had that conversation in long-term services and supports and we're starting to have that conversation. And you know, we in uh, the Administration for Community Living have made investments in the national core indicators which is a systemic look at your DD systems. Um, we're moving that system into uh, the aging and physical disability side. Um, and it's a lot, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of very technical work, but at the end of the day, it gives you information that you need. And it's an important conversation that, again, is part of this context. What do we care about? How do we balance the dignity of risk and keeping people safe. You know, what's more important to count? Whether or not a person has unpaid relationships in their life, and, the, and, and that means that they're spending time with people who are not either paid to be there or are family. Is that equally important with understanding what the rate of restraint is in a provider controlled setting with people with behavioral needs? I think it is. I think we need both pieces of information. So those conversations are unfolding at the federal level. Medicaid is fundamentally changing. I mean, it is. It's the, the reality. States are grappling with the new normal that is, you know, that, that uh, are our budget constraints. And many states are bringing managed care in in a variety of capacities. Um, I think that trend will continue. Um, I think that uh, states are having to innovate and come up with new ways to make sure that we can serve more people. Um, and at, at a time where, you know, the politics of government are front and center and very, very difficult conversations are taking place. Um, the demographics in the country are changing, right? Very different set of numbers when we look down the road to 2050 from where we are now. And for people who are needing long-term services and supports, we have a tremendous number of families who are the backbone of that work, right? Over 80% of long-term services and supports in this country provided to older adults come from family members. And over 75% of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, live with family of which over 25% of their caregivers are over the age of 60. 10,000 people a day in this country turn 65. We have some of the highest level of poverty that we've seen in our lifetime. And we have an economic divide that seems to be growing, not shrinking. Education is changing. We have education reform, right? Recently, the Federal Department of Education announced that they're going to be focused on what they're calling their results-driven accountability agenda. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act gets kids with disabilities into the room, right? Least restrictive environment. We're still a ways from that in many cases, but it gets you into the room, at least gets you in the building, gets you an IEP doesn't get you quality, doesn't get you outcomes. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act, also sometimes fondly or not so fondly, known as No Child Left Behind, brought the idea of accountability into the conversation, right? And we started talking about, okay, having your butt in the chair is not adequate. The kids actually have to learn something. And we're still a long way away from success on that front. But it's changing and it's moving in the right direction. 
And looking forward, I think when we look at what's happening at the federal level, staying out of any political commentary on the state of Congress, um, I think that we will see great pressures, regardless of what happens in November, around entitlement reform and what is happening with SSI and SSDI and ultimately Medicare and Medicaid. And so the time is ripe for this conversation. Guys are having the right conversation at the right time, given all of those pieces. So I have another kind of boring, but somewhat interesting to those of you who are wonks, set of numbers that I wanna just run through that are pretty sobering about families and families who are supporting others in this country. At any given time, approximately 42.1 million Americans are providing supports for an adult family member with limitations, right? So we're talking about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We're also talking about older adults and everybody in between. The average family caregiver for an adult is female, 49 years old, and works outside the home. At the same time, that, fam that mom, usually, sometimes sister, sometimes daughter, spends on average 20 hours a week providing assistance for a minimum of five years. Among family supporters of children with intellectual and developmental disabilities, 58% report spending more than 40 hours a week providing support, including 40% who spend more than 80 hours. In the aggregate, care provided by families in 2009 alone had an estimated economic value of $450 billion in this country. For the sake of comparison, Medicaid spending in 2009, the same year, on long-term service and supports amounted to $119 billion. The value of uncompensated, uncompensated supports was actually higher than all Medicaid spending, right? Acute and long-term which was federal and state about $361 billion. Families work pretty hard. Two out of three older people with disabilities who receive long-term service and supports at home get all of their care exclusively from family. Only 9% of at-home long-term service and supports for older adults is provided exclusively by paid providers. 75% of families caring for a child with IDDD report that they cannot find after-school care, non-institutional community services, trained and reliable providers, summer supports, residential supports when they need it, respite or other formal services. So with the number of people currently needing long-term services and supports at 10.9 million and expected to double by 2050, the need is high, and it will challenge our formal systems of support in our communities. For individuals, there's a fiscal impact. In 2009, 27% of family caregivers reported a moderate to high degree of financial hardship as a result of supporting a loved one. Among families caring with children, for children with intellectual and developmental disabilities, 21% report spending $1,000 or more per month for service and supports, the majority of which comes from personal income. Families of people aged 50 and older reported spending on average of $5,531 out of pocket to provide care. Again, those are out of pocket costs, not counted when we count the $450 billion in uncompensated care. 58% of families are currently employed while caring for someone. 69% have had to make workplace accommodations, including in some cases ceasing to work entirely in order to provide support. Income-related loss to family caregivers age 50 and over who leave the workforce to care for a person with disabilities averages nearly $116,000 over their working lifetime not to mention nearly $200,000 in lost lifetime social security and pension benefits. 
American companies experience an estimated cost of $33 billion per year in lo lost productivity, in addition to paying an estimated $13.4 billion per year in higher health care costs due to the physical impact on families providing support. It's a lot of sobering numbers. So, where's the good news? <laughs> it's in this room. And it's in communities across the country. Because amidst all of those numbers and all of those system changes and all of the policy and legislation occurring at the federal level, families, and I would argue in particular young families, and youth, the ADA generation, are looking at us and saying, thank you very much for developing all those fabulous systems, but no, thank you. It's not what I want. I don't want to live in a provider-controlled setting. I don't want to have those dependencies on the system. I'd like support when I need it, but I'd like a real life, thank you very much. Families want something new. And what you guys are doing is you're thinking through what that is and where that can go and how do you do that. And I'm really sorry because that is my cell phone ringing across the room. <laughs> and it's likely my daughter. <laughs> so there's real opportunity here, right? Um, so walking backwards for a second, um, the Administration on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities has a long history of supporting family support, putting money into our conversations, right? Since um, the mid-1990s, there has been an investment by that federal agency, often not very big, but there's been investments made in terms of trying to figure some of this out. In the 2000 reauthorization of the DD Act, we got Title II and family support was added as an authorization, but we've never had any funding from Congress. And so we've continued to use um, an authorization in the DD Act called the Projects of National Significance to fund that work. And there's an inherent tension in that because PNS on a relative scale is a very small amount of money across the entire country. It's just about just over eight million dollars which is nothing compared to those numbers we were just talking about, right? Um, and, it, and so it's not about, it, it can't be about funding or sustaining direct service approaches. Interestingly, this limitation has created the opportunity to think in different ways and to learn from what we've invested in the past two decades <coughs> and from the communities across the country. So we've had to evolve our thinking. And moving from a framing of the idea of family support programs, right? <laughs> I hear that you guys are all well trained and you know now that, you, that, that that goes in the quarter jar and that you have to talk about supporting families, right? Doing that means that we create an inherent responsibility to assist families in having the tools, strengths, and assets to facilitate a self-determined life and reciprocal relationships in our communities across the lifespan or life course of family members. In this new paradigm, we have to think about what is effective support for families and what it is not. So effective support for families is not about an explicitly set, ex excuse me, explicitly defined set of services. It's not just about the things that we can all name on one hand, respite, personal attendance supports, home modifications, targeted case management, because those are important, but at the end of the day, those don't get you real life. Effective support for families is not just about Medicaid. It is not just about Medicaid. It cannot just be about Medicaid. Supports to families 
should not be primarily driven by waiver definitions and match opportunities. Right? We, we kind of, we got Medicaidized, if I can use it as a verb, along the way. Right? When you go back and you look at the family support initiatives of the early 1980s, it was whatever it takes. Right? We want people to live, be able to be in their home. And if that means that you know, family A needs a fence because Johnny is a runner, we're going to buy the fence. And we're just going to do it. Well, then we got into service definitions. And if we couldn't figure out a way to match the money that it costs to build the fence, we said, oops, nope, 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 let's glue a staff support person to Johnny. Because even though it costs five times what the fence costs, we can get Medicaid money for it. There's a group that has these t-shirts that they use for one of their conferences, a family group that I love. It says, belonging is a human right, not a budget decision. We've got to get out of the budget box. And we have all these realities, right? <coughs> budget drives a lot. Effective support for families does not create yet another set of interactions, paperwork, and process issues for families. Okay, how many IIIIIP meetings do we have to sit in? Right? I got the IEP, I got the ISP, I got the IPP. You know, sometimes we add to the complexity and the deficits that families are already experiencing by piling on more and reduce their capacities further because we do the IIIIIPP thing. And instead of securing assistance that is meaningful to them and listening to what they need, we do process. Effective support for families is not a program or just a project. You guys are all here as a result of a project, but you are here as a result of a project that is focused on systems change and fundamental culture change, which is slow and incremental and sometimes harder than anything. But it lasts. Grant funding goes away. Systems change makes a difference in people's lives. It can't be packaged into a group of benchmarked outcomes with line item tasks attached and print it out on a single page with a bunch of check boxes. Oh, we got that done, that system's change is done, we're moving on to the next project. It doesn't work that way. Not what you guys are doing. So if it isn't any of those things, what is it? So a few years ago and before we had the Supporting Families Community Practice, a group of, of experts who've been struggling with these family support issues and supporting family issues got together uh, at, at wing spread, some of you may have heard of wing spread conferences before. It's a little place up in Wisconsin where people can come together and carve out this kind of space where you can think and talk and learn from each other. And um, so a group of, of folks did that in 2011. And um, we came up with the definition that all of you are using, or at least I think you're using, um, in the six states that are in the community of practice you're supposed to be using. Um, that talks about what it means to support families. And I'm just gonna read this because I, you know, I wanna paraphrase it. A comprehensive and coordinated set of strategies that are designed to ensure that families who are raising and supporting family members with intellectual and developmental disabilities have access to person-centered and family-centered resources, supports, services, and other assistance. These strategies are directed to the family but ultimately benefit the individual with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Right? Strategies, not services. The overall objective is to support families, including those from diverse cultures and backgrounds, in ways that maximize their capacity, strengths, and unique abilities so that they can best support, nurture, love, and facilitate the achievement of self-determination, interdependence, productivity, integration, and inclusion in all facets of community life for the family members. Now, for those of you who've ever read the DD Act, that will sound very familiar to you. Those are the, that is the goal of the DD Act. Re rewritten slightly. But that is what we need to be talking about when we think about family support. 
So John O'Brien of Georgia fame, not many, many other John O'Briens in the world, but those of you who are familiar with person-centered planning history and may know John and Connie Lyle O'Brien. Um, I've done a lot of writing and thinking over the years about person-centered planning and supporting individuals with significant disabilities. Um, brought together a small group of parent innovators, is what he liked to call them, a few years ago, um, to talk about what families need and to move beyond this conversation in the current service system. And came up with this list um, that I like because it's pretty representative and it's pretty straightforward in terms of some of the things that came out of the conversations with, again, how they define it, were, were family innovators, people who have not accepted what the traditional service system has to offer and said, wait a minute, we want more. First was a deep, a deep belief that their family member had the potential to confound limiting expectations. Right? If we could give that gift to every single family before their child was the age of five, it could fundamentally change our culture of low expectations. Right? And that siblings have to be a part of that. When we have this conversation, it's not just about the parents. It needs to be about the whole family. A recognition that sons and daughters grow into great people in community with others. We often focus on independence when we need to be thinking about interdependence. We focus on services and supports when we should be focused on social capital. We focus on benevolence when we should be focused on shared capacities and reciprocity. Membership in community is the greatest gift we can give people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. And when I say membership, I mean reciprocity. Valued roles in community, not just recipient of services. A conviction that individualized supports, and I would add, this is not John's words, mine, the values of inclusion, reciprocity, and access to a good life is the right thing that strengthens voice. Right? If you have that conviction, and if you could get that seed planted in every family, their ability to buffet all of the other messages would be greatly enhanced. And helping families understand how the decision that they make in terms of whether Johnny or Jane goes to kindergarten with their friends plays out when they turn 21. Because if Johnny or Jane goes to a segregated school across town, Johnny or Jane is not going to know the kids that live next door and are not going to have that social capital in their community in the same way. Families need each other. The organized support of other families makes it possible to deal positively with the difficult feelings that can keep expectations for a good life in community low. There's a, there's a group of families that do some support with other families out on the West Coast that like to call what they do the inoculation program, right? If we can get to families before the system teaches them something different, they can learn values, they can learn and understand inclusion and integration and reciprocity and social supports before somebody teaches them something different. But then families need booster shots along the way. <laughs> they need other families that continue to support them when the road is hard. And I can tell you that there's not a family in the world that that's not true for. When my daughter was in middle school, after being fully included all the way through school, we hit that point when somebody somewhere up the food chain in the school district decided 
that it was time for her to go into the life skills class. And I had to excuse an IEP meeting when they handed me this piece of paper that was one of those like, you want to what? <laughs> and then burst into tears. And I said, this IEP meeting is over. And I came back a couple weeks later with 10 people, my team. For every one of them, there was going to be one of mine. And almost every one of those people that came with me was another family member. Families need each other. Innovators are finding ways to build those peer-to-peer -peer supports using technology and social media. It doesn't have to be in person anymore. We can connect people in new ways. Service providers who are willing to partner in inventing the sorts of assistance that will make a person's supports more flexible and sustainable. You have to have the innovators. Too much of our voice has been co-opted <laughs> in too many circumstances by people who have a financial stake in the game. And we have really good, committed, and supported, and caring providers all across this country who need the room and the support to innovate. So we have to reconcile those two things. We also have to find ways to think about innovation in non-traditional ways. What is a provider? What is a support? Some of you have listened to me before, have heard my Trader Joe's story, and I'm not going to run down that road because I think I've told it too many times. But the short version of it <coughs> is that when my daughter was very young, and I was a single mom, and I had these three girls, and I needed a break, my local Trader Joe's was an awesome place where I could take my daughter and I could attach a balloon to her so I could see her in the whole store because it was a small and enclosed space and all the staff knew her. And I got an hour of shopping and she got an hour of running around and it became a couple of hours of rest but a week. Free. And I got the grocery shopping done. <laughs> Thinking about how we support people is not just always about the paid formal support system. And that doesn't diminish the paid formal support system, but it's about looking at capacities and making sure that families are not under house arrest and can't get out and figuring out how they can be part of community to meet their needs. We've spent so much of our energy on developing these incredible systems, right? I mean, we're, we're, next year is the 50th anniversary of Medicaid and Medicare. And we've built all these special programs. We've developed an entire industry to support people with disabilities. So, so many good things that have made a huge difference in people's lives. But we need to rethink some of them. Not all of these efforts have engendered and supported full inclusion and meaningful com community participation. Sometimes our good intentions get in the way of common sense. Back to the fence versus the staff. And an understanding of community interdependence. Why are families across this country reinventing provider-controlled settings with institutional characteristics under the guise of farmsteads, gated communities, and special villages. I don't know about you. I don't need to go live in a special village full of 
women in their 40s with short hair who grew up in the Midwest. I'd like to live in a diverse community of people and I don't know why we think it would be a good idea to take any population and say, there's your village. We've got people across the country doing that. Are we struggling with sheltered workshops because of expectations related to employment? And everything that goes along with that conversation that's been unfolding across the country? Or because families don't have adequate options that ensure the interdependencies of family, daily living, are taken into consideration and supported and managed. Transportation, how are mom and dad gonna get up and go to work in the morning? Or both, right? It's both the issues around expectations and employment, and I would argue how we support families to facilitate employment. What do we say to young families when we teach families of infants, toddlers, and young children to spend so much of their energy, their precious time and capacities, right, on how to intersect with our systems, right? How to intersect with our health system, how to intersect, this is how you do an IEP meeting, this is how you, you know, back to the IIIIIIPP thing. <laughs> Think about it, we, have, we, we build huge curricula and training just around how to intersect with the systems. Instead of saying, how do you intersect with your community? When was the last time you went to a PTA meeting? Instead of building family capacity and individual capacity, reciprocal relationships and opportunities to be valued members of communities, the message to families is far too often, focus on the service system. It is here, it will help you. That's great, it should be here, it should help us. It can't be primary. It is a means to an end, not an end unto itself. Families constantly talk about the transition cliff, right? How many of you like the transition cliff, right? Oh, the school bus, and God forbid it's the short bus, is going to stop showing up. Now what? Right? We're in the middle of that. We're sometimes the weird family, right? So we push for things that other people may feel uncomfortable with. So I wasn't real happy about what was going on with transition at my daughter's school. So I said, well, we're going to do a person center plan. Now, mind you, I live in a state where we have no services and the wait list is epic and there's 10,000 people in front of us. So we're like not even on the list. I said, we're going to do a person center plan because we need to have this conversation. Life is coming. You're turning 18. You're a senior in high school. We're having this conversation. So we did. We had, though we planned this day, it was awesome. We had 30 people come and sit for six hours and think through some things with her. Gifts, strengths, where she got her three, three point talking point. I'm energetic, I'm enthusiastic, I like to welcome people. Um, and we talked about a lot of things. And then full of bluster and joy, because I had actually gotten somebody, two people from the school to show up and the VR counselor actually came for all of an hour of a six hour meeting, but she came. I show up the next week for a meeting with the transition coordinator and the VR person. And the VR person excuses Zoe and says, I need to talk to you for a minute. I'm like, this is her meeting. Why are you saying, no, she's, I need to talk to you for a minute. Okay. So Zoe went to go run some errand down the hall. This VR counselor looks at me and says, I'm sitting there with, you know, a product of, 30, 40 pages of all these good ideas that all these people have come up with and we're all full of energy and we're at that point where we're like, okay, we have a plan. Which is, well, that's all well and good, but, you know, that's not reality. This is what I see in your daughter. She's not going to work. She's not ready. What? <laughs> And the conversation devolved 
from there around what I need to be doing about SSI and guardianship and da da da, right? So anyone who's a family member knows exactly what I'm talking about. And that has to fundamentally change. The low expectations are everywhere. So that transition cliff, that transition cliff is awfully real for families. And we have to figure out a better way. The narrative created early for families by those early influencers, whether they are an early intervention coordinator, a preschool teacher, a pediatrician, another family, therapist, a service provider, doesn't matter where it comes from, that embeds that idea of facilitating a quality life is the thing that makes a difference. It's the reason that <laughs> after that conversation, I was able to get up the next day and say, okay, I'm kind of done with VR wasting our time for now. And we're gonna focus on people who are gonna support this person to achieve her goals. And what has made that difference are all those things and that opportunity to have a vision that many families are not afforded. We are very lucky. If I had listened to the naysayers, Zoe wouldn't be where she is on the cusp of turning 18. She spent this past summer volunteering in three different organizations. She went to three different leadership conferences on college campuses without me, I mean I was there at one of them, but we were, she was staying in the dorms and I was in a hotel. I was staying in the dorms. <laughs> <laughs> and she was experiencing all the trials and tribulations of the college campus, right? So one night she locked herself out of the dorm and we had the involvement of the campus police and you know, we did those things. And she learned the joys of all you can eat in the cafeteria. <laughs> now deciding you know that maybe college is a good idea because there's those cafeterias and she's learning to articulate her own vision for her own life despite the pile of labels that people have put on her and despite people saying employment's not an option and despite the fact that somebody I loved and was in a, a, a critical part of our support team when she was four years old, you know, sat me down for the talk, right? And you parents know what I'm talking about, the talk, mm -hmm. the get real talk, mm -hmm. right? I need to modify my expectations. This is her IQ, this is her blah, 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 blah. Okay, great. If I had listened to that, I wouldn't be able to stand here talking to you today because I wouldn't be able to leave my house. We know that when families have trust in the community and in the service system, we have the space to create more sustainable <coughs> systems. Gandhi said that we should all live simply so others can simply live. I think families believe that. If we can get to a time where families feel like supports are flexible enough to say that we need less this year without feeling like next year if we need more, it's not gonna be there. They will take less. They will need less. And if families have trust and believe and understand that the community is rich with opportunity, we will go farther. Scarcity is the scariest and the most obvious when we think services have to solve everything and we don't have anything else. So we know there are three buckets of things that you are all doing and that we're thinking about in terms of primary strategies to support families. Three broad categories, right? It's pretty simple. One, knowledge, training, and skill development. Families don't know what they don't know and they need those opportunities. Two, families need those emotional and social supports. 
They need other families. They need the people who paid it before them. You know, first person I call when I'm having one of those days when the VR counselor says the things that she said, you know, is my friend who has a son who's 20 years older than my daughter, who's been my guide on the path before me. And third, the instrumental supports, the goods and services. I mean, those are not going to go away. We're still going to need to buy services and supports. We're still going to need to buy ramps. We're still going to need to do respite and all those things. But they are one part of the stool. They are one leg. They cannot stand alone. <coughs> Families also, there are, two, there are two other important aspects of supporting families that we've identified. Families need the flexibility to be able to adapt the supports and services to their particular circumstances, right? Coming in and saying, this is the package we offer. Oh, or you've got this package over here is not honoring the person. We have to be flexible, we have to listen, and we have to adapt. Secondly, the solutions, and this is where you all come in, need to be local, consistent with the culture of the local community, place-based, <coughs> in ways that communities can leverage their resources, and you have local ownership. You have reciprocity. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. <coughs> How are people with disabilities contributing to your communities? If they're not contributing, they don't have capital to get their needs met. And how are we making sure that we are encouraging those opportunities for people with disabilities, and I would argue older adults, to have those valued roles. So in the little bit that I've seen of what you guys are doing here in Connecticut, it looks like you're on the right path. The fact that you have this many people in the room here today is a huge testament for the work that you're doing. Your focus on collaboration is key. You're not going to be able to do this. There's nobody, you know, Margaret Mead, one person can make a difference, but we need everybody. <coughs> the commitment level to families and leveling the playing field for families is awesome. As, as someone who used to advocate at the grassroots level, and always felt like, okay, so the unions have this spot, and the providers have this spot, and the associations have that spot. The fact that you have created a space for families to be equal players in the conversation is huge. <coughs> and the other thing that I just wanted to acknowledge when I was reading through some of the pieces about what you're doing here in Connecticut is the generation gap and that you're looking at and thinking about the legacy systems and what do we need to do to continue to support people and not disrupt their lives, but move things along where we can. This difference that younger families have a different idea about what they might want. And then looking further down the road for the people who are currently not being served, people who are on wait lists, and remembering that all means all is really key. So when we look to the future, supporting families is going to need all of you. Your vision, your leadership, and your steadfast commitment, and your understanding that families are seeking empowerment and capacity. And that person-centered thinking, social capital, and reciprocal community relationships are critical to family success, not just services.
So I have a quote that I want to read back to my friend John O'Brien, who said, quote, Things change when parents stop believing that the system holds full responsibility and all necessary resources. They adopt a new pattern to guide their action. They work to gather a circle with the person that is animated by recognition of the person's inherent dignity and gifts and a commitment to supporting the person in a life of distinction. I love that, life of distinction. The whole circle holds responsibility for discovering, attracting, and organizing relationships, opportunities, knowledge, and the money necessary for a good life together. Thank you for working towards a good life for all people in Connecticut and their families. The work you're doing is important, and I'm really glad that you're here today. Thank you. at the Department of Developmental Services Production Studio in HD.